revisiting the solar warming project. And as you can he hear, there is some lovely mechanical sounds. I love that kind of um, flavor sound that they add to stuff. It's got this, th these things have got this nice, you know, powerful, loud clunk every time they move. And now they're automatically folding away. Let's get outside so we can uh, talk a little better. So I've made some uh, significant alterations to the uh, last solar warming project. Uh, before, I was just using a space with the passive radiators running through it to try to steal as much thermal energy as possible, solar energy as possible, and it didn't work out very well. Um, when I reloaded and said goodbye to the airs, the thermal forcing peaked at a 130 degrees. So prior to that, it would it would wave around a bit, but still it was close to the 120 to 140 range pre-atmospheric updates. Post-atmospheric updates, it went to 130 some odd here on the moon and just locked there. The sun would come up, it would beam down into the building, and it just wouldn't do anything. It would... Um, it wouldn't bleed off any, any heat either, but it wouldn't gain any more. With those radiators, those um, large uh, extendable radiators, all of that changes. Those radiators can absorb thermal energy far and above what the, the constant is in the game. Just hold on, I'll be right back. And those are the settings uh, down here. Now... In here it says uh, 469, but that might have been different in the last game. I'm not sure, or there could be some kind of um, shortfall. Like, these temperatures, in your greenhouses may not be able to get up to this temperature. It may only be able to get up to a, like a third of the temperature. Uh, I haven't played with it, and like I said, the save that I'm playing on is pre atmospherics patch uh whatever update so the these temperatures may not be um the same i have no idea but this is what's supposed to be the the, the maximum temperature that the that the star can force into an area all right let's get back to the to the save file but here we are with much higher temperatures like if we go in down here and we will open this up. This side is just open air right there. So the greenhouse has gotten up to 673 degrees Celsius. I've had difficulty controlling that temperature. Originally, I had, I had uh, put in some passive radiators just to get the temperature up. But then I started worrying if the temperature got up too high, it might melt the walls. So then I tried to pull the temperature down using portable air conditioners, and that didn't work at all. It seemed to just just freeze the temperature in place, but they they weren't very they weren't very effective. Plus they were pulling too much power. Right now this this whole setup pulls um a kilowatt of electricity. And that's a bit much on, in my mind. Most of that comes from, you know, just keeping these batteries charged. But it comes from other things too. Like I think each one of these, these, these power nodes, they pull a certain wattage. Uh, these guys all pull a wattage. And I'm using, uh, I'm using all of these to keep the, the pressure maintained in these, uh, in these few buildings. This one is just a waste building. <clears throat> I'll show you inside the building and my, my special little high-pressure airlock, which is not super special at all. I think blast doors are, are indestructible. I can't remember. I do know that they handle much higher pressure. Oh, and this. There we go. So, in here, I can't pull, uh, I can't pull the... Uh, uh, 
the tablet out because I don't have the fireproof tablet. But in here is 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 pretty hot. It's uh, 265 degrees, and it seems like every time I touch something, I burn. Oh no, I'm just burning. <laughs> I don't know what's burning. Let's pull the tool belt off too. There we go. Yeah, who knows? Oh, there we go. Yeah, it was something. Um, so I'm trying to push this temperature up, but that's that's seeming to be difficult. And there's quite a bit of mass here. Each one of these cells has uh, about four megapascals. And um, the reason that there are so many vents is so that you can pull a lot of pressure out all at once. I also very stupidly kept my uh, uh, my propulsion tank with me, and I wasn't supposed to because that uh, that could have been super dangerous. But nothing bad happened. Where's my tool belt? Oh, there it is. Put the light back on the tool belt. Eh, we lost the, the battery. Doesn't matter. Let's just keep on going. Uh, I'm only using one gas right now. It's a uh, pollutant. It's a... Uh, what did I say it was? Chlorine? And now, this, stru these structures over here is for cooling down. I was uh, experimenting and cooling the, um, the storage block, but I've cut that out for now. And here's just the thermal overflow tank. So we have 3.9 millipascals of water, me, me, megapascals of water at uh, 681 degrees. So we have quite a bit of thermal mass there. Uh, probably not enough to run stuff for a very long time, but this is a small greenhouse. This is a small thermal uh, plant. I also found that you don't need a lot of uh, gas in there to get the things going. You can't actually have those in vacuum and get as an efficient uh, absorption of light because when they're in direct sunlight in a vacuum, they seem to struggle to get above the baseline temperature, which again, it says in the menu that it's, it's four, 400 and something, but I was having difficulty in the hundreds range, like 112 or something like that. We will. I will load up my other experiment. Here's the other experiment, and basically this experiment, I was just trying to see if I could power a furnace solely by solar energy. And I've found a, a couple of problems with it. Like for instance, it's very hard, as I said, to get these these large radiators to go above 100 degrees if they're in vacuum. But as soon as you put a little bit of atmosphere around them, and, and I mean a tiny little bit, it doesn't need to be a lot. It can be like one or two kilopascals of anything, just to, just to give, just to prevent the, the unit from radiating out at any time. Because there seems to be certain periods of the day where they will just stop absorbing heat even though there's sunlight directly on them. In this experiment, uh, I was trying to pump up the, uh, the thermal differential by using uh, the air conditioners to, you know, just inject high temperature into this, into this line here. And it was, it was not unreasonable. Right now we're at uh, 267, or uh, 297 uh, degrees with a few, uh, a few kilomoles of of, uh, of gas, and then this is just uh, for stabilization. There's not a lot there, but limitations. Uh, let's pull this out. I think this will have the code that's running this. It's just a very simple code, so it's just uh, a basic solar code for for um, solar panels, but. Uh, this here, where is it? So this is the, uh, what's it called? The solar sensor? What is it called? A daylight sensor. 
So this is the daylight sensor on the top, if I can get the button. This is the daylight sensor on the top, and basically all of it's doing is, this is just telling it if it's in sunlight. And if it's in sunlight, open the shutters. That's it. Um, and this is important, because if the shutters are open at night, you will lose more than the energy that you brought in. Now, there's also uh, another way to artificially ramp up how much um, thermal energy you are absorbing. If this, if your water or your whatever substance that you're using as your medium is extremely cold, if it's super chilled, it will heat up much, much faster. There'll be a much, um, uh, a much higher gradient. I think, um, well, let's take a look at that right now. Just, just pause it for a sec. I'll be right back. Now, this might be super difficult to read just because of my, my native resolution in the, uh, on my computer, but um, these are some of the scripts to actually move atmosphere around uh, in the game. And this here, this number here, and this number here, these these two mathematical uh, variables, and then down here is uh, this is the passive script down here, which is a little more complicated, is what moves gas around the networks and as you can see it's fairly convoluted I don't know what it's based on so desired pressure here desired pressure change I'm not exactly sure where that's coming from I have looked in it uh, there's also a few flags here that I find interesting like state of state matter so that the, the the matter state sorry I read it backwards um, that tells me that there may actually be uh, state changes that are going to be introduced in the game. I don't know how long this has been in here because I didn't actually look at the code before. So this could make moving uh, fluids around much harder. And when I say fluids, I also i am including gas because gas is a fluid. So this, this, defini this definitely will change how ha atmosphere is handled into the future. But if we go down here to the passive script, uh, somewhere down here, it's basically, there we go, uh, max value of float. And this is for the third option of uh, move to equalize. So if we go back up to move, move to equalize, that is the desired pressure. So basically, the maximum value of float is some number. It's not 65535. It's, uh, it's a really large number. Anyways. Which is kind of weird to me, because why would you, why would there be, why would you be using the maximum value and, and then stripping it down? I, I thought, I would think that you would use the differential. Now, C is my worst language when it comes to programming. So, um, and I have a really large mental block, so I will read this and I will try to figure it out. And then like 10 minutes after I read it, I will flush it out of my mind because I hate C so much. I don't know why I hate C. Maybe I had a traumatic event when I was when I was a young adult. I have no idea, but I hate C. I will I will code in any other language that you that you put on the table. I will avoid C as much as possible. I have learned the basics of C half a dozen times, and each time I finish the project, it's ejected out of my mind and I have to relearn it again. Every single time I use it, I hate it. But uh, what you really, if you want to look at this stuff, just uh, download dot peak, go to the uh, uh, stationaries directory and look for the C sharp dot dill, and then you can decompile it and look at it. There's a there's a few dills in there that are uh, building these APIs for the for the game. But this is the move to equalize um, API. This one here, this uh, move to, to equalize bidirectional, is for, you know, just like the manual valve. But it's doing a lot of things that I'm not really sure why. Whatever, let's get back to the, let's get back to the game. Okay, back in the game again. So, uh, originally I had like uh, five of them here, but then I wanted to test what would happen if there was just um, one. And as you can see... We're getting some mediocre results. 
Let's put some gas in there. Now we have a little gas in there, and that gas will go up to some equalization temperature. Uh, unfortunately, now we can no longer get in to see what the uh, what the radiator is doing, but we can see that uh, we've gone up to 119. Like it's it's actually raising uh, quite a bit quicker than it was before. Uh, and it's not giving the proper results here. Right now it's saying that it's a, it's a millijoule, 300 millijoules going into the system. That is not the case. I think that, uh, I think this reading here that we're seeing is from these, uh, passive, um, these passive radiators clamped onto the, to this pipe here. So these numbers down here I don't think are accurate. Um, 71 joules being convected out might be accurate in there. I'm not 100% certain. But I think we're going to see a, a rapid warming. We're already above the 130 some odd that I said was difficult to get over. Without that gas in there, it was actually difficult to get over just 100. I should have I should have showed that off more, but take my word for it. It was difficult to get over 100. Uh, and now that the that the that the thing is closed, it's going back down, but it's not going down because it's being bled out. It's going down because um, that uh, that cell over there is pulling um, is pulling thermal energy out. So if I disconnect this, we can see that it's it's now uh, stable at 133. We'll put that back in just so just so that uh, that temperature pump will continue to function. Now over here. Uh, I don't think we went up much, did we? I don't remember what that temperature was before. This is not important because this is just a factor of, of this um, portable air conditioner, which is now the, the the super workhorse of the game. If they change this, I will be very sad. Please do not change the portable AC. Leave us something, okay? Or else give us give us a a a, 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 a transfer pump, a heat transfer pump that just moves heat from one side to the other. Screw the air conditioners. Screw the atmospheric air conditioners. They're not realistic. They're stupid. Just give us something that will just move temperature. Something that is a basic heat pump. That's that's all I want from this game. Please. Anyways. I should write one myself, but I don't want to, and I don't want to program and see. Even if it was Luca. If it was Luca, I would be all over that shit. I hate Luca too, but I don't hate Luca as much as C. Oh, God. Do I hate C? This is going to be my lamenting hour for C. Uh, it's also all self-sufficient. I'm not running um, a uh, um, RTG over here. I am running an RTG over here just because I haven't really looked to balance this out. Plus, I, I'm charging the nuclear battery in here, so we, we don't want that. And uh, we have a separator here. I don't care. Let's wait for the sun to come up, and then we'll continue to observe this. So now we're going back up. We lost about uh, 10C of thermal energy from that thing pumping away. And now we're boosting back up again. Uh, but we didn't drop below 100. As you saw when I first started the game, we were at our first start of the save, we were at 87. But now that we've just enclosed that thing with a little bit of atmosphere, uh, like 16 kilopascals of, of garbage, and it, it, it's also taking on some thermal energy. And, I mean, the, the, the atmosphere is lower than what the radiator is absorbing, which, which is fine. That should, that should go up to about 133 and then stop. Now, is this realistic? No. This, uh, the, the, the radiator should also be communicating with the atmosphere. The, the fact that the, that the atmosphere is insulating the radiator, that is accurate. If you, if you put in something to, like, if you put a, a steel sheet, okay, and you sit it in space, like just a, a, a sheet of aluminum or something, and you're sitting in its space, and it's being um, hit by the sun, it's going to shoot up. The, the temperature is going to, is going to skyrocket. 
But then if you roll around the, the planet and the sun is occluded, that temperature will drop like a stone. It will vomit all of its heat out immediately. But if you wrap it up in, in a, a, a cylinder of atmosphere, atmosphere is, atmosphere is like Cool Whip. It's, it's like, it's like frothy cream. It's got a lot of space in it. So when you're, when you're trying to make whipped cream and you start with cream, the, the cream is very dense. It's all in one spot. And then you, you, you put it in a blitzer and then you just, you, you froth it up so it's, it's much, much bigger and much, much foamier. And you have all of these little bubbles inside. That is what atmosphere is like. Atmosphere is just a big, fuzzy mass it's a big fuzzy piece of matter that is sitting around your solid piece of matter so that when the solid piece of matter is uh, radiating out energy it hits the fuzzy mass and the fuzzy mass will start picking up energy now transferring energy through radiation is very inefficient um, a lot of space shows and movies will you know space people and dump them outside and you'll see them freezing almost immediately they won't all of the exposed tissue like their eyes and their mouths and their ears and their butt and everything that will all evaporate any kind of fluid especially water very quickly but your skin is a good thermal insulator there there have been experiment accidents where people have been exposed to hard vacuums for like up to 10 or 15 seconds and have walked away fine. Your skin can hold your thermal energy inside very well and the radiating out will take... I calculated it once and I can't remember what it is. I think I'm exaggerating when I say months, but at least, you know, at least a couple weeks, like 10, 14 days. I don't know. I'm just bullshitting when I say those numbers, but it will take a long time to radiate out. If you take a bottle of water to space in an aluminum container, not a thermos flask, just an aluminum container. Thermos flask is, would be stupid in space because you already have a vacuum. But if you take that, that water bottle and you chuck it out into, into the, into orbit, it's not going to freeze immediately, and it may not actually freeze because it'll keep going into the sun. It might actually explode from the water vaporizing from the sun hitting it. The thermal forcing, uh, I'm probably using, I'm probably using that, that, uh, that word wrong, but the, the thermal radiation hitting the aluminum structure is far higher, in magnitudes higher, than the amount that a, that a black body that would, that would be, there's a high libido, but I mean, it's, when, when you're, when you're, when you're occluded from the sun, you're considered a black body because you have no, uh, you have no reflectiveness. Anyways, uh, no, I'm saying that wrong. Okay, I'm going to cut that part out. Suffice it to say, the amount of energy that you can, that you can dump into space from your tiny little body is far lower than what the sun can inject into you. So this is very accurate. The windows should be spilling out some um, energy as well. There should be some communication uh, between the vacuum and the windows. But I mean, you make bases on, on Venus, these windows worked as perfect insulators as long as the sun doesn't shine on it. So that seems to be a constant in the game that is not realistic. And, uh, I, by the way, I cut out a whole bunch of stuff there where I was rambling about and I was doing the maths wrong. And I, I did not do any research before I started blabbing off. This is just all stuff from memory. So, after blabbing on for a while, we're now at... Oh, that didn't, that equalized way above 130. I'm kind of surprised. So now we're at 175. And we are getting... See, it says it says millijoules, but um, those are moving much higher than millijoules. We'll go over here, and we will see we are now at 246. Now, just to prove that I didn't, you know, like 
I didn't uh, start the experiment in, in a weird place. Let's remove all that gas. And my case fan is now acting up on my computer. Isn't that nice? Although it's been acting up for years and I should replace it. Okay, now we have no atmosphere in here. We have a tiny bit. No, we have no atmosphere in here. Okay, good. And that uh, radiator is already dropping like a stone. So just that tiny bit amount of, of, of atmosphere and we can pump our um, we can pump our temperatures up much higher than we can expect. This is important because if we can do this, if we can insulate our radiators, you can then make an, a, a huge farm to run everything off of thermal energy. Now, that's not very practical in the game because the game makes it very easy for you to generate uh, electricity and to use um, other stuff. But, Jesus, look at that tilt. That is some, that is a wild tilt on Earth there. Like, that is distracting the hell out of me that's so wild. Look, look at that. That's, that's, that's past the 45 degree mark. The, the developers, you've, you've got to take these things into account because you have, you have people like, like, with Asperger's like me that looks at this and is completely taken out of the game. I would rather not see Earth. Seriously, I would rather not see Earth than see it at this what like this would be this would be an epic level disaster okay uh, uh antarctica would entirely thaw in this in in this scenario the the gulf stream would not function properly the minute the 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 atlantic conveyor would not function properly the earth would not the this would be we would not be able to live on this planet. Like, like you're rolling around like a like a like a, a like a bowling ball with top spin here. Jesus, you made me you made me forget everything I was talking about. You stupid false planet. Bleh. So we go back. Oh God, because uh, the the uh, the solar panels. They generate way too much electricity, but also these all of these little features and everything, all of the, the, the devices, they use up way too much power. It's not very realistic in that part. But I love running these kinds of experiments, and we got quite a bit of thermal energy just from those few minutes of having the uh, having the solar panel in a um, in an insulative atmosphere. Oh, it's not plummeting anymore. It's still going down slowly, but as you can see, the equalization temperature is much... Why isn't this... Oh, I put the logic reader down to see what the uh, what settings I can play with. Okay, back to the thermal farm. Unfortunately, because the game is so poorly balanced, there's really nothing you can do with this. I can make a huge solar collector here and run it off all off of sterlings or uh, run my furnaces with it but besides being in a challenge mode where you uh, presuppose that you're only going to do that you're only going to use uh, certain kinds of electricity or certain kinds of um, devices like right now i think like right now evil uh, cows are evil are is running a base where they're only using um, those uh, the Weezwort plants, whatever the hell the Weezwort plant calls, are called in stationers. And that's a fun little challenge, so maybe someone or myself wants to take on a thermal challenge where uh, you use very minimum solar energy from, from solar panels and just use radiators and stuff. Now, I don't know how well this would do with the basic radiators, the clamp-on ones. Um, I actually didn't test that out at all. I went straight to the to the big guys because uh, the big guys, you can pull uh, any amount of, of energy out of it by directing it at the sun. Uh, but as we saw with the with the smaller experiment, 
um, you can get a lot of energy out of there. Probably enough that um, if you're away mining, by the time you get back, if you've already reached your desired temperature, you could probably get back up to the uh, desired temperature to uh, make um, ingots and stuff. So it's a very good way to keep things warm is just by using this. That's I think that's the the the, the best takeaway from this. Just one of those panels uh, will probably be enough to keep your um, furnace uh, at least to keep it warm to keep it at a stable temperature. Uh, and maybe even heat it up a little. You don't need to use um, pipe heaters. And it's completely free energy. These these things don't require any electricity uh, to move. They just require the data, the data cable. And equally, if you needed to cool things down very quickly, these do a good job, but I mean, they all do a good job. I was playing an actual playthrough recently, and just with uh, five standard clamp-on radiators, I was able to keep an entire base lousy with windows cool. Um, the the cooling capacity of the radiators was higher than the uh, forcing capacity of the sun. So, that's my little experiment. Um, I like it, and uh, hopefully you like it too. And uh, get back into a position here where I can just look at the picture of my save file and know what I'm doing. Uh, no joke exit, just uh, use this information as you will and uh, try to have fun out there.